We recently tested the Hyundai Ionic 5, which has been the front runner in the which EV will my wife get saga. And she loved the Ionic 5, but she said she liked the more conventional look of the EV6 a bit more. So let's see if there's any difference between these two besides looks. The first thing that we'll cover is what everybody wants to hear, and that's your range. Now, your range in the wind rear wheel drive spec, you can max out at 310 miles, which is seven more than you would get in the comparable Hyundai version. Now, you can thank that to the square and anti-aerodynamic shape of the Ionic 5, which is of course a much more streamlined and aero-efficient shape in this EV6. However, what we have here is the dual motor all-wheel drive GT line, which is good for 274 miles, which again beats the 257 that you'd get in the comparable Ionic 5. Of course, be aware that heavy use of the climate controls will affect your range, but you will get a heat pump and also a live readout of just how much it will affect, unlike what we saw in the F-150 Lightning last week. Then this is the part of the Ionic 5 video where I go on a 40 minute rant about the regen options that you can get. So I'll keep it pretty simple for this. It's essentially the same thing. You've got paddles on your wheel here so you can dial up level zero, one, two, three, or I pedal, which is just varying degrees of how much you want the car to step in and uh, regeneratively brake for you. Of course, zero is nothing, it's just friction brakes and then you dial in regen from there. If you wanna see a more in-depth description on that, of course, check out the Ionic 5 video. But the only thing that I'll say, the difference here that I feel is I don't know if it's it's meant to be the more sporty or keyed up nature of the EV6 versus the Ionic 5, but I do feel like even in level one, when I take my foot off the throttle, it does more regen than I noticed in the Ionic 5, which makes it just and just a tiny, tiny bit harder to drive it perfectly smooth. I'll just mention quickly that in general, I hate the one pedal driving. It's a personal preference thing, but you can get used to it. My favorite setting was level one, as it's the most natural experience coming from an internal combustion car with some mild engine braking. Now let's go back to power, because I'm not sure that we covered that quite enough earlier. Now, all EVs at their core are kind of the same, right? And these two, the Ionic 5 and the EV6, are more similar than anything else, because of course they're, they're largely the same under the skin. So what you get here is the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack, which gives you the dual motors here in this GT line, which is good for 320 horsepower and 446 pound-feet of torque. The horsepower number is the same from the Hyundai, but the Hyundai makes 448 pound-feet of torque. Not a difference you'll notice behind the wheel, but it is just kind of a fun fact. So weirdly, in the more sporty EV6, you technically get less power. Zero to 60 is done in 4.6 seconds, which in Kia's propaganda packet that they furnished me with, want me to know without a shadow of a doubt that they're quicker to 60 than a Porsche Cayenne Coupe. Okay, so far we've talked a lot about how similar this is to its Hyundai sibling, but this is the Kia sister, which is supposed to be the more sporty and more exciting version. So, is it? Well, yes, it's very similar, but the steering is just a touch heftier and more engaging. The suspension is just a whisper firmer, and the way that the cockpit is designed does put me in the mentality or the headspace that this is more of a sports car and I should be driving it harder more than the relaxing nature that I got in the Ionic 5. However, that being said, this is not more sporty enough to justify the slightly harsher ride and also the lack of headroom that I have in here. I wouldn't say it's uncomfortable, but I can't wear a hat in this thing without hitting the top nub on the roof, even with the seat in its lowest setting. Also, for what this vehicle is, a compact or midsize EV SUV, I'm not taking it to the track ever, so I'd be fine with a slightly softer ride from Hyundai. So what it results in behind the wheel is something that's quicker than you were your first time, smoother than hot butter, and quieter than Paulo when I tell him that no, his iPhone doesn't get better images than my Sony camera. Altogether, behind the wheel, it's a pretty nice car, and I would say objectively, it's still a better option to get from A to B than a gas car. It's a great car, and so is its sister, the Ionic 5, but let's step out and see where the similarities aren't so glaring. Okay, 
and then, as we start to talk about the exterior design, this is one of the reasons that Sadie didn't want to go ahead, or she wanted to wait, I should say, uh, until we had this thing for a week before she made any decision on the Ionic 5. And I get it, because what she had said was that the front end on this looks a little bit more conventionally aggressive. It looks more like a conventional car rather than the 80s cyberpunk thing that the Ionic 5 has going. I totally get it. I do think it's an attractive front end. I think that you have a very tapered hood here. It's got a nice red uh, deep with flake paint. You've got some nice sharp creases up here. And then you have these LED running lights that almost seem like they're being sucked in by a black hole that is this center grill. And of course it's not functional, it's not opening, it's not cooling anything, uh, but you do have a little bit of like a mesh pattern to it as well as your 360 or your front facing camera. You do have parking sensors down here and your more conventional bumper. And then your lower valence looks kind of sports car. You do have a mirrored, although enlarged effect from, from the upper grille with this mesh pattern, as well as your um, radar cruise and a little bit of aero in here to cool the front motors as well as the battery. And then you do have functional air curtains on the side to bring air around the wheels, make the car more aerodynamic. You'll notice that the hood is pretty short though, and that's one of the reasons that you don't have much of a frunk. There's just not much there, uh, which is, I guess it's fine because what it translates to is more room on the interior. But around the side here, the important thing that we talk about, especially with the Mach-E, since they're both the same color spec, is this has body colored wheel arches. This is specific to the GT line trim. The lower trims will get black treatments, uh, but I like the fact that it's body colored here. Now you do get Continental cross contact tires wrapped around 20 inch wheels. That's an upgrade for the GT line and they have uh, black and silver two-tone and they're a, a thicker spoke to make it more aerodynamic, less air gets in, all that sort of stuff we're used to seeing. Around the back here, as we continue, we've got a black A-pillar and half the roof, not the full roof like in the Ionic 5, but half the roof is a sunroof. Uh, and then of course you have black window treatments, you've got your black wing mirror. It's kind of like pointy on the ends as if it's like Batman's wing mirror. I don't know, I guess it's kind of cool, but you have a very conventional uh, Hyundai Kia lever style door handle. Although operating this, it just, it doesn't quite, I don't know, it, it seems maybe just a touch cheaper and, and by a touch I mean like, one to five percent cheaper than on the Hyundai. But again, you have black treatments down on your rocker panel, and then you've got a bit of a flared hip here, and kind of a baseball brim style spoiler back here. Of course, you've got black that comes down into your rear bumper or your rear uh, glass, and then you have the really cool reflector that transitions into the full width LED tail bar, and it's striped. You know, we talk about Kia having like the tiger nose style front end, and it's, it's kind of a variation up there, but this with the stripes does make it feel very tiger and i like that it kind of has that element to it and then down here it has this dark chrome which it would have been fine if it was just dark chrome but they made it they, they went an extra step with it to give it a little bit of dimension and i really really appreciate that you have non-functional air curtains in your lower valence you've got your badges back here and then all the way down at the bottom you have your reverse lights and i don't know why they say this because it's a really cool detail they mirrored kind of like the the mesh I don't even know what you would call it, but like peg pattern up from the front, they put it down here in your lower bumper. So that's a really cool effect. Uh, and it just kind of is hidden down here. Of course, you've got your reverse camera here, uh, but let's step inside. Okay, then the interior of the EV6 here, and this is I think where I was expecting it to be more Ionic 5, and it really isn't. This is a noticeably, well, it's obviously a darker cabin, so it's, it feels a little bit more claustrophobic inherently, but it also is smaller. Uh, the wheelbase is four inches shorter, the car itself is smaller, it's riding lower, the roof is a little bit lower, and you just don't have the same interior volume. Like, I have the seat in its lowest possible position right now, and if I tilt my head over to where it's not under the sunroof, the little knob on the top of my hat, that will hit the roof. So I cannot actually sit in here with a hat on unless I want my hat to continue to hit the roof, and then it makes that annoying scratching sound. So it's not perfect and we'll get to some other stuff but you do have a sunroof that's not like we mentioned as big as the ionic 5 but it does open so that's kind of nice um <clears throat> this the trunk is is also seems to be a little bit smaller than the mach e the model y and the ionic 5 you know that's partially due to the roof uh and, and you know taking up a bunch of space with that kind of more tapered design more sporty design um and then you do have a little bit more storage under the trunk floor 
But in terms of the overall design of the cabin here, it's kind of a nice two-tone design where it's all very black, but you do have some, you know, aluminum accenting, some brushed silvers, uh, and you do have the white two-tone interior. And it actually is really, really nice. Like you have this vegan leather or this recycled leather with the Alcantara and the white and the stitching all in the seats, plus they're heated, plus they're cooled. You also have a heated steering. Like it's very, very nice, especially for a Kia. Uh, some level of quality and design that you wouldn't expect and to see the design in the in the meridian sound the speaker covers especially up front it's just really cool the attention to detail here and then you look at the dash the upper portion of the dash here it's got some you know mirrored design from your center console and a whole bunch of this interior is made out of recycled materials which is very cool you love to see it you do have some you know small bits of ambient lighting in your uh, in your vents, it doesn't go blue to make it colder and red to make it hotter like you would see in a Mercedes. Uh, but you do have a little bit, not quite as much as the Ionic 5, but a little bit of an ambient light to make it feel like a more upmarket, more premium experience. But from an ergonomic and usability perspective, it is also very different from the Ionic 5. The Ionic 5 is very open. There's you know a huge pass through in your center uh, area between your driver and your passenger where you could you know roll you know, water bottles or whatever, it's much more conventionally closed off. It's much more conventional cockpit here. Uh, you still have the dual screens, which is fantastic, uh, but they have a little bit more traditional uh, integration into the dash. And then you've got this kind of center console here with your cooled seat, your heated seat, and all that stuff that we talked about, as well as your gear selector. Uh, you have a wireless charging pad here, some cup holders, and some additional storage for your center console. Now, interestingly, underneath here, you also have a big storage bin, kind of like you did in the Ionic 5, except it's more attached to the center console. The weird thing is, you have a USB-A and a USB-C down there, and you have additional chargers, but the bin itself is where I would put my emotional support water bottle, because it's the only place that's big enough to, to house it in here. But it says, it's stamped into the plastic, do not put water bottles in there. Like, why? What else am I going to put in there? But let's talk about some of the technology stuff. Now, I did mention that you have a digital cluster. I think it's like 10 and a quarter inches in terms of the screen size. But it's, again, all of like the same graphics that you would get in the Ionic 5. It's got all the same information. It makes a lot of sense. I like it a lot. Also, the same thing with your center infotainment screen, 10.25 inches. The big difference here is you don't get wireless Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. You have to use the USB tether, which you didn't in the Ionic 5. Uh, you do have quiet mode in here, but one of the cool things is you have active sound design, so you can change your sound from stylish to like sporty and like a couple other things. You can, you can adjust how loud or how soft you want it. It's kind of cool. You also, of course, have 360 cameras, your augmented reality, you know, parking situation that you would see kind of like almost in a BMW. Uh, and then you do have a head-up display with the augmented reality stuff built in that we covered from the Ionic 5. So it, you get a lot of technology. I think the biggest miss for me is you have this really nice wireless charging pad right next to you, super natural for you to put your phone there, but you have to USB tether to use CarPlay. You know, so then I end up having to plug something into the floor which defeats the purpose of this nice, convenient charging mat right next to me. So that is a little bit of a miss. But in terms of the technology and what you do get, the wirelessness is really the only thing that it's missing. Oh, but that does remind me we should talk about the, the autopilot, quote unquote. So you have the uh, Highway Driving Assist 2, which is very good. We constantly sing the praises of the Hyundai Kia uh, autopilot system. It's very good here as well. Through the construction around my house, it had no problems, didn't skip a beat whatsoever. Also, I do want to mention, we talked about the Meridian sound system. You can select if you want it to have like a natural sound, a surround sound. And, you know, again, it's just some of these, these little bits that are kind of over the top and give you a lot of customization. One of the things that gives you too much customization is this little area underneath your infotainment where you would control either, not both, but either your climate controls or your hard, I guess they're not even hard buttons, they're shortcut buttons to operate the infotainment system. So the knob that's on the left, right now it's my volume knob, but if I hit this here, now it's gonna make it hotter or colder. So, you know, what if, it's just, it's not a good design because if I go to interact with it now and then I'm not paying attention for an hour and I want to turn the volume down, I have to do it on my steering wheel, which I want the volume to be on the left and it's on the right, but then I'm going for this knob and then all of a sudden I'm not understanding why the music isn't getting quieter, but all of a sudden I'm getting way colder. So I really don't like that. I think it's better in the Ionic 5. Again, it's probably something that you could get used to, but I really don't, <laughs> I don't like it.
but I'll kind of stop my rant before it goes too far. Uh, talking about the back seats, again, the wheelbase on this is is very long, so you tra it translates into a lot of rear seat leg room, which is fantastic. I can sit behind myself with like two, three, four inches of knee room, which is great. But again, the roof is a little bit shorter. That eats into headroom. You know, there's there's not a roof bringing light all the way back there. It's black. It does feel dark. It does feel a little bit uh, more claustrophobic than you would get in the Hyundai. Now you do have a full 120 volt outlet back there. Uh, you have your uh, climate vents on the. Uh, B pillars rather than in your center console. In the Hyundai it made sense because that moved, this one does not. Uh, and you do get heated seats back there, which is, you know, again, a nice touch, but like I find myself saying with, with basically everything in here, objectively, it's still a good EV. I would still have this over a Tesla Model Y. This is probably on par with the Mach-E. However, given my week with this thing, I'm, I'm more surprised than I thought I would be in how much more I like the Ionic 5 than this. This is still a great EV, but I like the Ionic 5 a lot more than I thought I would as compared to this thing. So that's the Kia EV6 GT line. Its closest competitor, obviously, as we've been talking about through this whole video, is the Ionic 5. And I went into this week thinking that the EV6 was going to be incredibly similar to the Ionic 5. And yet, I'm left with the end of this week thinking, I really do prefer the Ionic 5, and I wasn't expecting there to be such a difference in my feelings between the two. So if it were me, and I were to recommend something, I might lean towards the Hyundai. But thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.